This was sent to me through Twitter from Vic Mandrake. I was censored in the Gamergate forum for the quote-unquote bigotry of disapproving of a tranny character in a video game. Look who Gamergate is up against. The likes of Will Wheaton and Chris Cluey. And, um, yeah, I get it. These are real intimidating intellectual titans, but you don't defeat your enemies by behaving in the exact same way. I don't need to tell you that anti-SJW and SJW are pretty much the same thing at this point. Of course, I do not like SJWs, but never interrupt your enemy while he's making a mistake. And SJWs are a big fucking mistake on leftism's behalf. But the point here with this tweet is that if you're looking to Gamergate as anything other than a means by which Gawker and Anita Sarkeesian can become screwed, then you're going to be disappointed as I have been disappointed. I feel the question before, do you think that Gamergate will lead people to reactionary conservative thinking, right-wing thinking? And the answer, I think, now that it's been some weeks since I've answered that question, is no. Because past behavior indicates present and future behavior. 2005, what was done about the hot coffee scandal when radical feminist Hillary Clinton was raising a stink about it. Over a hidden piece of code that could not be accessed through normal means. But despite this, my children, my objectification of women, was the official line taken. That is what was put into law. Not in terms of legislation, but the SRB reclassified Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the game containing this bit of code which allowed you to go in for coffee and have sex with your date. And this is not a part of the normal game, if you don't remember this. Um, this was revealed by somebody playing the PC version of the game, which is why this scandal came about almost a year after the game was released on the PlayStation 2. Hillary Clinton got her way because Rockstar was forced to re-release the game. Most movie theaters will not carry NC-17 movies. Most retailers will not carry adults-only games. It's expected that a bunch of nerds won't fight back against somebody with more balls than them. But they didn't, and that's the main point here. They don't even raise any concerns when video games have horrible moral messages like Grand Theft Auto 4 had, which had a pro-illegal immigration message to it. Nobody gives a shit that Bioware, like Chris Cluey, has an endless obsession with gay sex. But I got more to talk about, including more spineless nerds. Uh, welcome to Common Filth Radio, episode 23. If you would like to financially support this show, go to commonfiltradio.bandcamp.com. Two dollars or more gets you Common Filth Radio, the best of 2014. You can also do your Amazon shopping, your Amazon.com shopping, through the affiliate link below. Making the rounds recently on the internet is this blog, Stuff Eurasians Like, and um, I'll link to it below if I remember. He uh, wrote a post, this blog is authored by a half-white, uh, half-Asian male. He wrote a post called The Perks of Being Genetically Doomed from Birth. And if you need proof of the perils of having mixed-race children, look no further than this post. And my friend William wanted me to mention him here, so I'm mentioning him here. He wanted me to mention how he's half and half, and not half-white, half-Asian, but now he has identity issues, and he's struggled with them his whole life. I don't know if that's true or not. I think he just wants the attention, so here you go, buddy. Anyway, I'll read a little bit from this post here and read a comment which I think sums up my feelings, or at least close to them. So, here goes the first paragraph. I have my share of regrets. Should I have done this or that? But at the end of the day, it isn't worth speculating about the lives I could have lived. There aren't many could have beens for Eurasian men. If 95% of white women are going to reject me for being half Asian, no matter what I do, it's not like I had any chance of being so elite as to win the 5%. I think I have managed this horrible hap of life as best I could. Perhaps I was in way over my head seeking out hyper-masculine adventures to live out. But as delusional as those fantastic attempts might have been, I can't hate the past me too much for having my head in the clouds. For here, I'm on the brink of suicide, since I have failed to be a man. Since I live in a society that does not consider me to be a male, 
So why hate on any attempt to be a He-Man, no matter how impossible or foolhardy? The perk of being predestined to fail is I don't need to regret anything. And indeed, it's not like there is any one big mistake I made. It was just a long series of fails and rejections. No one ever liked me because I was Eurasian. I was always the odd man out. I clearly wasn't white. And Asian men didn't want to be friends with someone who embodied their racial humiliation. While I generally identify with the emasculation of Asian men on this blog out of self-interest, the fact is that I have not gotten along better with Asian men than white men. Most of my hatred has been directed at Asian women, not white women. But if anything, my relations with white girls have been even worse. So with the people I like and the people I hate, I still have equally bad relations. I'm going to stop reading right there momentarily because this guy is clearly depressed and has other issues and the struggles with his identity, that that's contributing to it significantly. It might not be the root of his problems, but if they weren't there, he would have a lot less of a problem. Also, what is with this whole idea of, oh, Asian men are emasculated? If they were that emasculated, there would not be a billion of them. There would not be a billion Chinese people, amongst the other varieties of Asian you can think of. One in seven people on this earth are Chinese. And yeah, I know about the tiger mom culture and all, but they're fucking a lot, and I don't think that people that fuck a lot are entirely emasculated. Somehow, because this guy's mom had a heart that went doki-doki when she met this white guy, that means she was emasculating some Asian guy in the process. And maybe that was the case, but from what I've read, nothing seems to indicate that. If literal racial cuckoldry were the reason for this guy's existence, that would be fucked up, but that would be a highly individual uh, case that would not be indicative of anything broader as this guy seems to think. Anyway, let's read on. I have alluded to some flirting I did with white girls while I was off this blog, but it's nothing really. I can't say any of these girls liked me or were even being nice. They were being civil. They were not actively cursing me out as the Eurasian freak I am. That's the best I can hope for. I guess white girls have matured since puberty. When I was a boy, white girls did not have to be shy to let me know what a freak I was. Anyway, let's read on. I have alluded to some flirting I did with white girls while I was off this blog, but it's nothing really. I can't say any of these girls liked me or were even being nice. They were being civil. They were not actively cursing me out as the Eurasian freak I am. That's the best I can hope for. I guess white girls have matured since puberty. When I was a boy, white girls did not have to be shy to let me know what a freak I was. It wasn't racialized, but clearly I'm a Eurasian freak above all, and that is why I will never belong. It is painful being Hapa. You are cut off from all humans, and even your own parents who gave you birth don't understand your predicament. Sadly, a white dad and Asian mom are the least people on earth who can understand the pain of a half-Asian man. I receive universal hatred from white men and Asian women, it is to be expected, but also from colored men and white women. I'm a real-life ogre, a monster from a freak show. I get treated like a subhuman mutant everywhere I go. You know, even if this dude got what he wanted, which is some white women, where do white women at? He would still be this way. The self-loathing is so far beyond what I've ever encountered that even pussy couldn't cure this shit. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. If you want to read the whole thing, you can do that if I remember to link to it below, which I will attempt to remind myself to do that. Anyway, he says... And the outcome of the white male Asian female wave, the WMAF son. I'm totally defined by the white male Asian female relationship. I'm a WMAF son above all. And the gender pairing does matter, as explored in my posts on the very different outcomes for AMWF sons, Asian male, uh, white female sons. Perhaps in a way I'm jealous of AMWF sons. In the same way I didn't get along with full Asian men, I had a mighty conflict with an AMWF son and his white girlfriend. <laughs> oh boy. I guess I was just jealous. Jealous that we were both Eurasian, but I have to be the failed type of Eurasian. And right here is where we see that 
this entire blog is just a rationalization, an excuse for sexual market failure. Even though pussy won't cure this guy. No, not at all. But if it really mattered that much to him, he just changes expectations. You might say that the weird ranty stylings of this guy's blog comes from the fact that he's been rejected by so many women, but I think it's the opposite. This guy really needs to change himself in order to attract any sort of woman, be it white or not white. Two people left him a comment, and this was one of them. I sympathize with your situation and your personal experience. However, after reading many of your posts here, I've sensed a lot of self-hate, inferiority, complex, and low self-esteem, which unfortunately won't make things any better for yourself. I think you've blamed too much of your failures and difficulties on the dating scene on your parents, on your WMAF ethnic background. It also feels that you have problems with your self-identity. You're very angry when white people see you as an Asian male and not as a white male, even though you're half white, half Asian. It is true that there is a lot of prejudice and discrimination against Asian males in Western society, especially in the dating market. However, there are Asian guys who are popular with white girls. There are many AMWF couples, even though not as many as WMAF couples. No matter which ethnic background you have, as a young man, what makes you interesting to a nice girl? Is it your good looks and athletic body, your intelligence, charm, confidence, and humor, or your career, success, and wealth? If you don't possess any of these things, even though you're 100% pure white, you'll still be seen as a loser and you won't be able to attract nice girls. This is pretty close to what I would have said to him if I cared enough to say anything, but I think it's ultimately a lost cause to give this kid advice, whoever he may be, because he just seems to be content to blame whatever it is is going on in his head on his background the genetic hand he has been dealt but this is what's dangerous about internalizing the marxist view of the world which is there is the oppressed and then there is the oppressor and whoever is the oppressed they get to be seen favorably through the lens of history somebody needs to tell this kid yeah you'll be seen as favorable by lobotomized academics sometime in the future, but when you're dead, you ain't getting laid. When you're alive now, you're not getting laid. When you see yourself as oppressed, you aren't getting laid, which is what he seems to be after. That seems to be the one thing that he's after, even though I don't think it'll be doing him any good in the long term or the short term. What kind of fucked up generation do we have on our hands here that millennials would rather be seen as being on the right side of history than getting their dick wet. This guy might say that he wants white women and that'll do him good and he can't do it because of this, but if you were really serious about getting laid or whatever he wants by white women, he would put his energy into improving himself rather than writing ranty blog posts, rather than writing these angst-filled screeds. So I feel bad for this guy. I don't want him to be how he is, but... I can only comment upon it, but the one thing I can say for sure is that he should not take advice for the Pope, who said that men should listen to women more. They should listen to their ideas. That's take advice from the Pope, rather. But yeah, read Genesis. You had the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had the Garden of Eden. God just said, hey, don't eat the fucking apple. And Eve is like, hey, Adam, let's eat the apple. This snake here said it was okay. So Adam, being the dick thinker that he was, ate the apple. You can apply this to anything. The fall of man coming at the hands of a lady. How many pregnancies can be blamed on? I'm not ovulating. You could come inside me. Didn't I say last week that this guy's an idiot? And can Israel find a way, a pretext, for uh, the invasion of Vatican City? Because um, I would sign up for that. Just think of all the other shit that Pope Francis has said, like, oh, I'm not a Marxist, but Marxists are good people. And now he's pushing the carbon credit scam by saying that industrialization is a betrayal of God. It's a betrayal in the eyes of God because... It's a betrayal of nature. Well, if it was a betrayal, why did God give us fossil fuels? Why did God give us all of this wonderful oil? God gave us wind, but he did not give us those ugly, unsightly turbines. 
And I'll remind my listeners again, 2009 Climate Gate, Hadley CRU. Look it up. I'm not going to go so far and say that Pope Francis is the Antichrist, but let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if that ended up being the case. Christ didn't make out with the feet of HIV patients, so just putting that out there. Anyway, from Pope Closet Case, we go to this. Comes from the Washington Times, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, this is about kids of uh, gay parents. Dawn Stefanowicz said her gay father was so preoccupied with sex that when she was in high school and brought home a male classmate, both her father and his lover propositioned him for sex. Bian Klein said her mother and lesbian partner disdained heterosexual families completely, and she didn't have a clue about the daily interactions of a husband and wife until she went into foster care. Robert Oscar Lopez said his two lesbian mothers were conscientious about his upbringing, but he became so emotionally confused that he turned to gay prostitution as a teen and gay and bisexual relationships as an adult. Many moons ago, I mentioned this study about lesbian mothers and the effect that lesbian mothers have on their children. And this fact in and of itself that this study exists rather than those, um, the results of two uh, male homosexual parents, um, it supports the fact that female homosexuality is a bit of a myth because there was a big stink about how there was um, the study, the people that did the study, they included mothers who had previous heterosexual encounters or relationships. And I've read from other sources that an alarming amount of lesbians have had previous heterosexual relationships. So, And with female homosexuality, there are really no out outward indicators, any physical indicators that they are indeed homosexual, unlike males where there are physical indicators of homosexuality. And not just in, oh, they have a torn up butthole. No, it's facial morphology and pituitary gland and things like that. But the overall point here is that this is what you get when you experiment with unproven sociological techniques. This is what happens when you turn people into lab rats. We should really start calling this the age of human experimentation, and that's probably going to be the subtitle of this show because you have a human experiment in the half-white, half-Asian kid, you have the human experiment, and let's let women take the lead, according to the Pope, and now you have uh, homosexual parents when homosexual relationships cannot produce children uh, on their own. And it seems like every other week or day or whatever, however long of a period of time you want to apply to it, I see on Drudge Report these reports of human clones with three different parents. I'm just like, what the fuck are we doing? Does it occur to anybody in our culture that just because we can doesn't mean we should? A common criticism I see is that conservatives offer no solutions of their own. They're just anti liberal solutions, they're anti leftist solutions. But you know what the conservative solution is? It's pretty simple. Which is why you don't have to reiterate it all the time. Which is why you don't have to convince people of it. Which is why you don't have every major institution preaching these things. It's very simple. Don't base your life on stupid shit. That's the conservative answer. All the anti-stuff just comes from that basic idea. That very simple idea. Look how far civilization has come. With one man, one woman making babies. Look at how far we've come without kids born of three different parents. Look how far we've come without kids who've been raised by two daddies or two mommies. Look how far we've come without becoming a miscegenated mush of mystery meat. But it seems to me that we've come so far that these people are starting to think that they've had fuck all to do with it. We, the pro-normals and the pro-straight and narrows, have become victims of our own success that we've allowed certain aspects of our society to grow and thrive under the guise of tolerance. I think it was Holly Himmler who said on the Shitlord Report that tolerance goes to acceptance and acceptance goes to celebration. It's already too late. People should have already been doing something 10, 20, 30 years ago. And now we have, well, we need lesbian parents because we need more sex positivity. Sex workers are feminists, too. That's something I learned recently, that SWERF feminism is a thing. You know what it stands for? It stands for Sex Worker Exclusionary Radical Feminism. 
But hey, if there wasn't a thriving low culture in Western civilization, there would be no common filth radio. So give credit where credit's due. I hope you guys are enjoying the new series, Tumblristas. I got a new episode coming out on Thursday and every Thursday. Should let people know that this channel updates every Tuesday and Thursday, but I don't want to be like some professional YouTuber type who's all like, oh, I'm going to make a song for the days of the week that I upload. It's like, no, that's, that's humiliating. But I bring this up because collecting the screenshots and writing my commentary for those episodes has taken up a lot of my time. Um, time that I would normally spend answering emails. So I apologize to those of you who send me emails. I usually send something back, but recently I haven't been able to because I like to give more than just a one-line response or a one-sentence or two-sentence response. So I just haven't bothered doing it um, altogether. And I figured that giving good answers on this show to your emails would be would be a better way to go about it. But with that being said, we'll get to the email questions in a little bit. First, we'll go through the Ask FM questions and the link to my Ask FM is below, and I don't answer them on my account. I just read them and answer them on this show. So we'll get through these and then see how many email questions we can do because those are generally more in depth and require a little bit more doing. So we'll see where I am after this. First up, do you think you lack empathy? On an individual level, no, I don't think I lack it because I completely understand the feelings that people have. I understand sadness. I understand anger. I understand worry. I understand depression. What I do lack is tolerance. Tolerance for the solutions that people have for their problems. And empathy requires understanding of feelings. I understand that feelings are important on a individual level, on a level where it's interacting between one person and another. I get that feelings are important with regard to relationships. But on a cultural, societal level, feelings have absolutely nothing to do with anything. Anything good, anyway. Because, take somebody who would want to help the poor. No one wants to be poor. People can understand that. Most people have been poor, and they will choose, no, I don't want to be poor, if given a choice. So what do they do? They vote themselves more EBT money. The Sipples that don't have to live around them, that live in their Northern California gated communities, they don't have to live around the people that they subsidize. So like, oh, I like helping the poor. I want to have the warm fuzzies. I'm going to mark this part on the ballot box. I'm going to vote for this candidate who will raise property taxes so they could help the poor. If we're going to define empathy in this way in what we do, then no, I don't have any empathy because... I realize that if I'm just going to help a poor person, that's just me, me and that person. That's between us, okay? And that's fine. But when you start introducing the state, for example, into matters of, oh, we need to help these people, we need to help these people over here, we need to take from these people, that I have a problem with. Because then you are introducing a middleman to the transfer of resources from one fortunate person to an unfortunate person. That middleman being the welfare state, which grows into an uncontrollable monster, where people make careers out of it, where people spend their whole lives on it, either working for it or being the recipient of it. The middleman, the welfare state, makes empathy a negative. It makes empathy into this grand-scaled thing where your money is going to where it shouldn't go. There's a lot more I can say about it, but it's kind of an open-ended question. And with open-ended questions, I think that you can go on a long time, but I have to cut myself off after a certain point. So this is where I will cut myself off and get into the next question, which is about... CF, what do you think about the possibility of hate speech laws being enacted in America? The First Amendment explicitly says that Congress is not to prohibit speech, but Congress, as we know, is only a small part of the culture, and corporations have a far broader influence on the culture, and they have a lot of hate speech policies, um, including the site that I'm on now, which is why I have to tone down some of the opinions that I have in order to express them through this platform. So in a way, it's already illegal to 
say certain kinds of things because your livelihood will be stripped away if you do say those things. In a cultural respect, it already is sort of enacted, these hate speech laws, but in 20 to 40 years is when I'd start, um, is when I'd say that it would start happening on the legal level because that's when millennials will begin to enter public office. And millennials are so solipsistic and eunuch that they hate anything that hurts anybody's feelings. It is a possibility, I think, and more than that, I think it's a probability that at some point the First Amendment will be repealed. I think that the Bill of Rights is one of few things about America that I consider myself conservative towards. But, again, people have no reverence for that because it was written by old white cishet men who didn't have Tumblr blogs. They didn't know what life was like. They didn't have an iPhone. They didn't have a smartphone. What do they know? Fuck Benjamin Franklin. He never took a selfie. He didn't fight the patriarchy by hashtagging every possible feminist hashtag you could on Instagram. I mean, he wasn't there when that one football team played that other football team and it was a trending topic. The architects of civilization sure missed out on a lot. Alright, next question. ICF, is there anyone who you wouldn't want listening to your show? The JIDF. NAMBLA. They're another group that I don't want listening to my show. Hey CF, what's your take on some of the Western-ish nations outside of the U.S. and Europe? Like nations like Australia, New Zealand, and to a lesser extent, South Africa. Do you think any of these countries or ones like them are particularly respectable or degenerate? Thanks, from Jake. Well, South Africa is an irredeemable rape-soaked hellhole, so I don't understand why people are like, oh, apartheid, so bad, but life is worse for everyone under apartheid, and you know, Rhodesia, you know, there were, that was like another place where things were okay until, oh, gotta have Mugabe. But I know a few people from Australia and New Zealand, and I've never been to any of these places before. I'm woefully under-traveled, but um, the people I've talked to from Australia and the people that I know from New Zealand, um, to a lesser extent, they're not to a lesser extent, they're lesser people, but I know fewer people from New Zealand, and they're all decent people that, you know, maybe they aren't indicative of the culture, the broader culture there, but there are some people receptive to my worldview and the ideas I have. We have some commonality there. And I have Australian listeners, and I think I have some New Zealand listeners as well, so beyond my um, circle of people that I talk to, my correspondents, there are people that Tune into the show from those locales, and maybe you're from there. I don't know. I don't know where you sent it from. But with regard to the societal health of these places, the cultural stance of these locales, um, I'm not entirely sure other than the fact that just from what I see as a very, very distant outsider is that things aren't much different there than in the U.S., um, in Australia and New Zealand. I don't see it as much different, but... I, from what I understand, um, they do have more of a hostile take towards uh, speech laws, even though the right political parties are much further right than what you'd find in America, where there really is no right-wing party. What I admire about um, Australia's system, and I'm not familiar with New Zealand's, but their heads of state actually have to go in front of... Um, for in front of fellow politicians and defend their ideas. And in America, they don't have to go in front of the Senate or Congress. And from what I've seen, those Australian hearings or whatever you want to call them, they get pretty wild and make for some entertaining viewing. You don't get to see Obama getting his ass handed to him in front of a rowdy room full of drunken politicians. So that's disappointing. The only negativity I have towards Australia and New Zealand are the same things that I feel negative towards about American culture, certain ideas um, being increasingly accepted here. So, But other than that, um, no problems with Australians, no problems with Kiwis. So I got two more Ask FM questions, and one was sent um, at the time of... Uh, so I guess it would be about two hours ago, because I took the screenshot at... Okay, so it's a question about uh, platonic relations and um, do you believe people who think marriage isn't for them and so on and so on. I'm going to answer that question next week and uh, get to anti-democracy blogs question sent um, about seven hours ago as of this screenshot. So it's from anti-democracy blog. 
What do you think parents should keep from children technology wise? Do you think parents should not have a TV at all? Maybe just use it as a monitor for selected videos. Do you think they should not allow their kids computers or just filtered internet access? Smartphones? Just dumb phones? Thanks. A few years ago, I listened to a lecture, um, a sermon rather, by Seraphim Rose, who said that if you do not have the courage to throw out your television set, you should highly regulate what your children are allowed to see. I said before on the show that I don't think technology in and of itself is the problem, even though it seems to be 99% horrible and damaging. I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle with regards to technology, so like in most things, you need to place boundaries on your children. Whether it's technology or playing outside or bedtimes, you need to have clear-cut boundaries with your children or else they're going to be miserable. Children need structure and rules. And that seems to be a problem that parents have is that they do not place boundaries on their children because maybe they're technologically illiterate, maybe they don't know what's out there, but for whatever reason, they don't do it. So I think that family can have a harmonious relationship with technology. It, maybe not harmonious, but one that isn't antagonistic. And I think that can be done by, you know, not having cable for one and, you know, having a select amount of movies to uh, choose from and um, what else. So yeah, having the computer out in the family room where everybody can see what everybody is doing. Sorry, I'm sitting on a noisy chair here, but yeah, it's it's all a matter of boundaries. And with smartphones and dumb phones, you know, I would, you know, if you need to keep in contact with your kid, I would say, yeah, get the uh, get them a dumb phone. But um, so yeah, smartphones, I think, are more difficult to maintain uh, boundaries with because those are portable and private and they can go take it somewhere else and, you know, send nudes on Snapchat or whatever. In my opinion, smartphones are the only thing that should be kept out of reach of children at all times because smartphones can be kept away from watchful eyes. With TV and computers, you can introduce stuff to your child without um making them feel alienated or like they're missing out on something. I got this question from the rightstuff.biz contributor Ryan McMahon. He asks, what do you think of bronies in general and bronies that claim to be right wing? Bronies in general, I've been avoiding that subject for the last four years, you know, ever since I heard about them or ever since they came into existence. And I started seeing brony merchandise at Hot Topic, you know, at the mall that's in the window. I'm not actually fucking going Hot Topic, don't get the wrong idea. All I can gather from bronies in general is that, oh, man-child wants to feel important, like he's a part of something, which I get. That's what happens when you live a life of complete social isolation. Your mind does some weird shit. And conservative bronies, that's just more snowflake upon snowflake action, because what conservatism is there to be found in a cartoon horse show for girls? I would be tempted to blame single motherhood, but... You know, conservative Bernie's, oh, we support the nuclear family. Well, okay, fine, but you watch a show for girls and you identify as a fucking Brony. The funny story, the same time that I became familiar with Bronyism, well, first time that everybody came became familiar with it, I started realizing that in a lot of right-wing circles, they were posting about K-pop bands like uh, Girls' Generation. They were calling these plastic Korean girls East Aryan waifus and putting them uh, in front of backdrops of the uh, Third Reich flag. They were calling these plastic Korean girls East Aryan waifus and putting them uh, in front of backdrops of the uh, Third Reich flag. The subgroup within the subgroup phenomenon is uh, definitely a sign of our times where everybody is encouraged to do their own fucking little thing rather than go with something a little more acceptable and mainstream. And it's like, I get it, mainstream ideas are pretty shitty and they don't take you very far anymore, but it's like, don't apply your hobbies and say, like, your hobbies are an affirmation of some deep conservatism because it's just, it's going to make you look like an idiot, which is what conservative bronies, it's the impression I get from them. I'm going to do some email questions. This one's from mine who sent me some interesting stuff about uh, Presbyterian churches that um he has some experience with that and... uh that's cool because, like I said, I don't have much experience um, outside of, you know, non-denominational bro church, I guess you can call it. Which I have nothing against because it was largely a positive experience, but it does tend to be a bit toothless. But anyway, mine has two questions. Um, one I will get to next week, 
and uh, one I will get to now. What are your thoughts on monarchy? Does it give a foundation to a nation like England? Does its absence cause rootless nations like America to delve into a consumeristic feel-good mindset? Or is it an outdated system that should have been removed a long time ago? I view monarchies as sort of a territorial democracy where if you don't like one king, you're like, well, fuck you, I'm going to go over with this king and fight with him instead. I don't know if there's any historical precedence for that, but if you look at Europe, it's it's a bunch of small regions, and, you know, Europe as a landmass isn't, you know, that significant um, when compared to Africa or Asia, yet it's split up into all these different kingdoms, and yet they accomplished more than almost everyone. And I know people like to bring up to me, well, democracy is not really a democracy in America, and look, I get it, but people are allowed to cast votes. They cast votes you know, for their representative, and in local elections where they could vote on propositions, which they do have a direct effect on. So the culture, if not the system, is democratic. Everybody has a say in what goes on, and that's reflected in the beauty standards. Look at de democratic beauty standards, and not big D Democrat as in the Democratic Party, but beauty standards is in democracy, what they look like in democracy. You know what they look like? They look like Anna Nicole Smith and Kim Kardashian. But what does that have to do with how I feel about monarchy? Very few things are truly beautiful in a democracy that do not come from natural beauty. Because America is a beautiful place if you aren't looking at its buildings. If you're looking at its scenery, its, its nature, America is a wonderful place. But if we are going to go by man-made beauty, what beauty is capable in the minds of man, in the eyes of man, through the hands of man, then it's no contest. Cultures informed by monarchy rather than democracy are infinitely more beautiful. Compare the Sistine Chapel and the Statue of Liberty. It's no contest. So just from an aesthetic perspective, monarchy is infinitely superior to democracy, but in terms of functioning governments, um, I think that American-style democracy has proven itself to be a miserable failure. I read once that George Washington was so popular that um that they wanted to make him king of America. And that wouldn't have been a bad choice, but he didn't want it. I think despite democracy's failures and the failures of the people when they put their minds together as a whole, um, they still have a yearning for hierarchy. We've had tons of Kennedy family politicians, starting with JFK, um, maybe even before that, I'm not sure, but yeah, every one of his relatives was in U.S. government in some capacity. And obviously you have the Clintons and the Bushes, and in the next few decades we'll have an Obama legacy, which I'm not looking forward to, but it just goes to show you people like the idea of having a lineage of leadership. Unfortunately, as in most things, it, it, the lineage of leadership has uh, degraded as time has gone on, so monarchy in America wouldn't make much sense, given that we're seeing who the people want as king. And the potential kings get worse, too. The potential queens get worse. It's like, do I want Zuckerberg's half-caste children to be ruling over me in some capacity down the road. No, I don't want that. I'm not one of these tabula rasa types that thinks that, oh, well, if we just made people kings, then they'd be good. No, it doesn't work like that. The crown is informed by the nobility, just as civilized people create civilization. Civilization creates uncivilized people. So having said all that, where I stand on monarchy... I am in favor of monarchy where it has a lengthy tradition, but I am in, not in favor of it in places like America where we do not encourage noble behavior. Next up from QC. Hi, I wanted to ask you a question about identity in America. I recently had a conversation with a friend and he got very upset when I stated that saying I am an American isn't an identity. What do you think about America's lack of identity? Do you think we should segregate our people? Well, with regards to segregation, I have said that the survival of America as a uh, cultural entity, um, there is no future in it. So that's why I support the balkanization of the U.S. That way, people who believe one set of things can go to a certain part of America and the other portion of people can go to another or 
you know, if there's any gray area between that, America's a pretty big place, so there's enough room to do it. We had our chance to separate back in the Civil War days, but Abraham Lincoln was this idiot that thinks that preserving this union that's less than however many years old it was at the time is it needs to be preserved because um reasons the south had good reason to segregate and it was wasn't because of slavery they were a different people you go to the south they're still a different people it's a completely different culture down there just as west virginia is a completely different culture from the rest of the east coast you think west virginians have anything in common with californians fuck no but I'm an American as an identity is pretty vague, but I don't think that it's completely invalid as an identity as long as the country is what it is. Like I said, you'll get a better idea of who somebody is if they say, I'm a West Virginian or I'm a New Yorker. And I leave California out of that because California is divided between these little pockets that resemble Scandinavia and the rest of it resembles Mexico. I'm not opposed to identity, but I am opposed to identity politics. And calling yourself an American with respect to identity politics is a bit odd because most Americans don't interact with other nations, um, people of other nations in a political context. I'd much rather have people saying that, oh, I identify as an American or I'm an American rather than the shit that they seem to identify uh, themselves with now like oh i'm a trans man faith healer glitch kin or whatever a vaporwave kin now, i shouldn't bring vaporwave into this because vaporwave is actually pretty normal i've had some vaporwave on the show actually um as buffer music when i was doing that anyway next question from hun i was going to save this question for a more timely date like valentine's day but due to current life events i decided to ask it sooner is a man only worth something if he has had sex is a man who hasn't had sex worth less than a man who has had sex? Should men or people in general be ashamed for being a virgin? We as men are designed to be leaders. Leaders of the weaker among us, like women and children. If you are a competent guiding hand, a competent leader, a person with a backbone, a spine, a woman is likely to reward you with a bloodline because of this. And that is ultimately what sexual intercourse is for, is to have babies. But obviously in the age of birth control and pleasure seeking, that is no longer the case. But the principle of it is still intact. If you have had consensual sex in your lifetime, that just goes to show you, you saw a leadership role through to the natural conclusion of it. God gave us these bigger, stronger bodies for a reason. He gave them to us so that we can protect. And this is why virginity for a man, even though the technical definition of virgin, only women can be virgins, but we'll ignore that for now. Only the man knows whether or not he has had sex or not. Nobody else can know. I mean, you might be able to gather some information on the guy, whether or not he's had sex from his demeanor or his attitude or his general behavior. But the reason why you see this sub weird subculture of like R9K, you know, these robots are all like, oh, I'm a virgin and this is weird. I'm not a Chad Thundercock. They're upset with themselves because they know they are not fit to be leaders. They're not fulfilling their natural role as men. And maybe they're being too hard on themselves because I see very few people fit to be leaders in this day and age. The fact that we are disgusted by things like cuckolding at least normal people are, is because that man is actively rejecting the fact that he is supposed to lead a woman, to lead his family. So with that in mind, I have a lot more disgust towards the cuckold than I do the virgin, because the virgin isn't quite sure of himself yet. He isn't quite sure how to go about his leadership role, the natural role God intended for him. But there are people that can actively reject what was intended for them and dwelling in their virginity and content to be a wizard for the rest of their lives you know i am almost as disgusted by that but not quite so to all the virgins out there be a leader be strong become good at something because even the guys who are really good at fighting video games the guys that compete in street fighter tournaments even those guys have girlfriends so and there is not much more i can imagine weirder than that with regards to a professional skill anyway. 
So with that being said, I'm out of questions as it stands. Um, not out of questions, I'm just out of energy. But if you sent a question in in the last week and I didn't get to it in this episode, don't worry, I will get to it next week. And uh, you can count on that. That was a great question. I was, I was not quite sure how I would approach that. And it didn't come to mind until I sat in front of the microphone here. But yeah, I mean... The reason why you have R9K and that sort of subculture is because boys are not taught how to lead. Men are not taught how to lead because they have no leadership roles in their lives. Again, I could blame single motherhood, and that's certainly to blame for it, but on the other hand, a lot of brutal Casanova types could be made from that, which you know might explain some things, but those things will go unexplained for now because it's at least a very good blog post, the idea that I have have notes on them for now but if it's good enough it could be turned into a book so I don't want to share any details at this point because again very preliminary stages I also ignored the Valentine's Day angle of that question and to anybody out there who's like oh I gotta get a date and time for Valentine's Day well just don't don't put yourself in that kind of pressure and don't make yourself feel bad I mean Think about all the bad dates that'll be going down on Valentine's Day and on March 14th, you know, those girls will still be single, so just go for that. There will be a lot less pressure and life will be a lot more enjoyable. But that is enough babbling for now. It is way too late or too early and I'm very tired, so. But I enjoy doing this. It is worth doing and it is worth doing because you people enjoy it, and you people send in questions, and if you would like to send in a question, go to commonfilth at commonfilth.com, uh, that is my email address, send it all to there, or if you want to ask anonymously or semi-anonymously, go to the Ask FM link below, um, just click show description or whatever the YouTube button says, and uh, go from there. So just a quick reminder, I got new episode of Tumblr East is coming out on Thursday, and every Thursday, show comes out every Tuesday, but I already talked about that. So as always, thank you so much for listening and I will see you guys next week. Bye.